So, um, good afternoon to everyone and also good evening for those of us joining us from Europe, including uh, Mark Wins, who is in Switzerland at the moment. Um, welcome to this Politic of Psychic Life speaker series. This is one of the four series that is that we hold in the division of social and transcultural psychiatry. With this speaker series, Politic of Psychic Life, the goal is really to think about how mental life or mental health occur in an ecology. Um, it is not enough to say that mental health is shaped by, let's say, cultural or social factors. Uh, it, we need to go, let's say, in more detail in what is going on in the materially, uh, in the local world where people live. And in this sense, uh, we felt that the work of uh, Mark Wins really aligned with this uh, idea because um, he developed uh, innovative methodologies to describe what is going on at the local level. And I, I think he will talk about, uh, about this with us today. So Mark Wins, who holds a, a PhD in geography from the University of Neuchâtel, uh, worked there as a temporary, temporary lecturer and a postdoctoral researcher. Uh, in his work, Mark addresses the city psychosis nexus with an interdisciplinary approach drawing on and striving to cross-fertilize the use of digital, digital phenotyping in mental health research on the one side, and stress and emotional arousal research in cities using ambulatory physiological measure on the other. His work has been published in renowned international journals such as Biosocieties and Health and Place. So um, even though uh, he's now a Dr. Mark Wins, he asked me to call him Mark, so that's why I call him uh, Mark today. So. Now, without further ado, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, just one quick thing. I think I'm not in control of the PowerPoint. I can... No, I'm in control, so you have to ask me and I will. OK, I'll... fine. Thank you. Um, so yeah, hello and welcome, everybody. Thanks for attending. Uh, bonjour et bienvenue uh, à ma présentation. Uh, it, as it has been said, I've been invited by Vincent to talk about my doctoral research as this research seems to fit very well in this series and because uh, I used uh, particular methods and a specific methodological approach that intrigued uh, Vincent. So thank you Vincent for the invitation and for giving me the opportunity today to share my work with you. Um, as it has been said, I'm a geographer. Um, I've done my PhD uh, at the University of Neuchâtel Institute of Geography, and I defended this, uh, my thesis this summer, so not so long ago. Um, my research is uh, situated at the intersection of uh, health geography and psychiatry. In addition, the approach I have developed is an attempt to cross-fertilize, uh, cross-fertilization between biosensing research on stress and emotions in urban settings, and uh, urban mental health research and geography. Uh, as such, it is also an attempt uh, to answer the call in the social sciences to recreate some collaborative partnerships with the life sciences and to embrace this alliance uh, uh, and to develop new modes of investigations. So I'm pleased to share with you today my PhD uh, project. It has been a long journey uh, and it is, of course, impossible to sum up this, these six years and my whole research in 20 or 30 minutes. But I hope that at the end of the presentation, you'll have a pretty clear idea of uh, what I've done, why I've done it, and how I have done it. Um, in addition to sharing my PhD project, I asked Vincent the permission to share with you a project that I just started working on. Uh, although not officially yet, because the project hasn't started, uh, we're still waiting for financial uh, finances to uh, to come through. Um, and I think that uh, this topic will be of interest for you as well, uh, as it fits uh, also, in my opinion, to uh, the discussion and the topic and the topic we have here. And it's also a kind of a continuation of my own PhD research. Um, so you can uh, switch to the next slide. Yes. Uh, I will focus today on, uh, on six uh, parts. I will uh, give some bit of a context to the research in order to settle some 
some aspects, uh, discuss or present the objectives of my uh, PhD study, and then I spend some time discussing the, the specific methodology I used. I will discuss the contribution and main results, and then uh, discuss the limits and further research perspective. And from then on, I will uh, switch to this new project, which is called Urban Remediation. Um, you can switch, please. So today, <clears throat> the growing cities face multiple challenges, uh, including employment, housing, energy, and food supply, transportation systems, and other infrastructures and services such as education. The impact of cities on health in general and on mental health in particular is one of these concerns, and it is in a broad sense the topic of my doctoral research. Urban environments are polarized milieus when it comes to mental health. They are both associated with positive and negative outcomes. Urban living is associated with a reduce, uh, reduced risk for suicide and for dementia, for example, uh, when compared to rural living. And on the opposite, uh, it has been found that anxiety disorders increase by more than 20% in urban populations, and that urban living increases the risk for developing mood disorders by almost 40%. Now, with regard to psychosis, the specific topic of uh, my study, uh, this differential is even higher. For example, a meta-analysis, I mean, a study that is based on several other studies, found that the risk of developing psychosis is more than twice as high, 2.37, uh, for persons with a history of urban living when compared to uh, persons with a history of rural living. Thus, urban living uh, is known today to be a risk factor for psychosis in the global north, especially. Uh, however, the mechanisms responsible uh, for it, or to put it in other words, why psychosis is associated with urban areas remains largely unknown. Um, you can switch to the next. Um, among other uh, hypotheses, uh, urban stress has been proposed as one plausible uh, pathway relating psychosis to cities, because on the one side, stress is part of several uh, etiological models of psychosis, often as a precipitating factor. And on the other, urban living and urban upbringing have both been found to affect uh, neurological uh, response to stress. Uh, it has been suggested that urban upbringing may increase psychosis risk through stress sensitization, for example, which refers to the process whereby repeated exposure to stress increases the response to a later exposure of a new stressor, even if that new stressor is less important. However, Urban stress remains today a broad and rather fuzzy category. Uh, hence, identifying which situations, which urban situations are the most stress inducing and why is of crucial importance. This is precisely the issue I address in my doctoral research, working with persons living with early psychosis. Uh, yes, thanks. Um, so, this is the research question that guided my, uh, my whole study, and I will read it out um, because there's several aspects in it. So I formulated the following question, how is the experience of the social and material urban environment in, involved in creating physiological arousal, stress and feelings of well-being in person having experienced a first episode of psychosis and persons with an at-risk mental state for psychosis? Um, so there are several things in here, and I will el elaborate on them um, later on with this physiological arousal, which refers to a more bodily uh, stress reaction and feelings uh, of stress or well-being, with, which refers more to uh, an experienced and narrative uh, aspect of stress. And uh, there's also the two populations I worked with, meaning people having experienced a first episode of psychosis 
and people who have been identified as uh, at risk for developing uh, psychosis. I elaborated a conceptual framework based on the notions of ambiance urbaine, uh, stemming from the French context and affective atmospheres, which is uh, uh, more an English-based context uh, concept. And I use them as a conceptual lens to break down, break down my research uh, question, my main research question, into uh, three research axes uh, on three levels. So the first being the aspects relating to the built environment that often goes a little bit forgotten in research and aspects relating to the sensory uh, perceptions and stimulations that prevail in urban environments and then aspects relating to the fact that we move throughout the city, uh, avoiding uh, considering the city as a static object, which I framed uh, with the idea of uh, spatial transitions. Um, so, yeah, thanks. Um, it was the idea behind my PhD project was um, that I would take the opportunity uh, um, to seize uh, this opportunity for developing a project and a method that would challenge me a bit as a researcher, but also challenge uh, uh, a bit more established uh, research uh, methods uh, existing in the field. And I saw this uh, doctoral research as a means to try out at the risk of facing major difficulties, new ways of tackling a subject that has a long history, in fact, uh, but that still needs further investigations. So um, the map on the left is uh, the famous map from Ferris and Dunham, which uh, dates back to 1939, and um, which was a very static conception of uh, urban areas to uh, a more biosocial urban experience of the city. And this, I think, will get uh, more uh, and clearer throughout my presentation. So um, I think you can switch to the next one. Um, my study design is based on a, a mixed method approach, uh, combining biosensing I used uh, um, to uh, examine physiological arousal and indices of uh, physiological stress, narrative data, through qualitative mobile interviews uh, used to provide self-reported uh, material on balance and causal triggers, and environmental data uh, through GPS and video recordings to document uh, the urban context. So basically, <clears throat> what I did is uh, mobile interviews in the city center of Basel, uh, a city in Switzerland, but with a little bit of equipment. So my participants were wearing the Empatica E4 bracelet you see on the slide, which monitors uh, skin conductance. And I will get to it, uh, to this aspect in a moment. Myself, I was uh, wearing the GoPro camera, you can see, uh, and I was wearing it on the chest uh, and I used it to document uh, uh, the urban environment during the walks. So I did not film the participants themselves, but document uh, the urban environment. And in addition, we had uh, microphones for recording our discussion, which in the end um, gave me spatially located qualitative uh, uh, interviews. And finally, uh, I tracked our uh, path uh, with a GPS uh, in order to be able to produce in a second step skin conductance variation maps throughout the city. So the path we followed uh, throughout uh, uh, the study was partly predefined by myself uh, for comparative purposes uh, and partly left to the choice of the participants. So um, I think you can, yeah, thanks. Biosensing refers uh, to the measurement of various uh, somatic and physiological variables such as heart rate or blood volume pulse 
skin temperature, uh, skin conductance, breathing patterns, for example. And in recent years, uh, biosensors have become portable and affordable for both researchers and everyday users. These new tools have been as advanced as, and I cite Osborne and Jones here, as offering the potential to explore the participants' reactions at an embodied level beyond the subjectivity of self-reporting. So to experiment with these, uh, um, with the potential of these technologies, I used skin conductance. Now, skin conductance is uh, basically the monitoring of small sweat reactions. Uh, and skin conductance is considered as an indicator of both psychological and physiological arousal linked to emotions and linked to the fight or flight system, also called acute stress response of our bodies. As such, uh, it is used as an index of emotional uh, arousal and of stress level, of physiological bodily stress levels. Um, however, since uh, the data coll collected through monitoring of skin conductance and this bracelet does only give indices of physiological reactions that are decontextualized, it is important to combine this data with qualitative narrative uh, data used to provide self-reported experiences, self-reported experiences of stress, for example, and of emotion, and uh, of potential causal triggers. It also allows uh, uh, to explore stress on two different levels, meaning one being more bodily and more visceral, and the other uh, being more consciously expressed, expressed through language. And in addition, uh, as I said, for interpretation purposes, the urban environment was documented through video and GPS to enrich uh, the two other data sets. For my study, I had the chance to be able to work with uh, a program in the city of Basel uh, called Basel Early Treatment Center, which is a specialized mental health unit at the University Psychiatric Clinics in Basel committed to the early detection of psychotic and other, and other serious mental illnesses in young people. I had to, the opportunity to recruit participants through this program. Now, I hadn't the opportunity to recruit a lot of patients, so it's a rather a small uh, sample. I worked with five uh, persons having experienced a first episode of psychosis four persons with an at-risk mental state for uh, psychosis. And in addition, I added a small control group. Um, as I said, this sounds rather small as uh, for a sample, but it is primarily due to the difficulty in recruiting participants within mental health services, especially uh, when not coming from uh, uh, this discipline. Uh, so as a geographer, uh, you had to convince first uh, people working in Basel that this was a good idea. And it is also due to the time intensive uh, methodology I uh, implemented in this uh, research. So I conducted my field work in Basel uh, with participants living in the area, since I wanted uh, the participants to be familiar uh, with the city. Um, and of course, uh, the whole research, the whole research protocol has been approved by uh, the local ethics committee before implementation. Uh, um, and Switzerland adopted in 2014 uh, a, a, a law, a federal act on research involving human beings that is uh, very uh, specific on those aspects. So uh, it's not an easy task, let's say so, as a young researcher to uh, get through this approval because you have to lay down everything you do even before you can start the research. Um, I think you can switch to the next one. Um, so the data I collected needed a fair amount of uh, preparation uh, and pre-processing 
before it could be used in the analysis. And this uh, concerns especially the skin conductance data. Um, skin conductance is collected at the rates of four samples per second. And we did walks of about an hour. And uh, it is reputed uh, um, to contain a lot of artifacts, especially when working uh, outside of the controlled uh, areas of a laboratory. So um, it has to be said that skin conducting has been used for decades in labs, um, in controlled spaces where rigorous protocol exists. However, outside of this context, when using it in real world settings, there is no single guideline or golden standard or procedure as to how to work with this data. So um, managing the skin, skin conductance data uh, required a bit of a DIY science approach, let's say. Uh, um, moreover, because I wasn't familiar with this data before starting uh, to work with it. Um, this is why I sometimes like to frame uh, my research as a bit of a bricolage science, uh, trying to find my own way and, and getting robust enough uh, procedure uh, to be able to interpret it, the data and also uh, make sense of it. So I'll skip the details here. Uh, uh, but the data processing took a while and a fair amount of preparation, and it has been made possible uh, through a collaboration with the School of Engineering here in uh, Neuchâtel uh, for the pre-processing steps. And then in the following step, I uh, worked with a cartographer uh, in order to produce the maps you can see here on the slide, uh, which are a cartographic projection of the skin conductance variations throughout the path. Um, so I did these kind of maps uh, for every and each participant uh, I uh, walked uh, with. So these are individual participant uh, maps. And I also produced uh, um, um, aggregated maps where uh, we combined the data of each group, although or even if they're small, to uh, make collective uh, maps. I think you can switch the next one. Um, yeah. Um, so with all these three data sets, uh, I proceeded uh, uh, analysis through a triangulation process, um, entering analysis each time with a different uh, one of the three uh, data sets. So um, for example, uh, the biosensing uh, led approach. So took the physiological data as a starting point, looking for points of fluctuation within this data, arousal or deactivation or different trends. <clears throat> and then I went to the other two data sets to contextualize uh, by examining the videos, uh, uh, for example, and the interview data to explore uh, uh, trigger or balance and so, or some specific areas uh, or, or what's happening in the city at that moment. And then the environmental-led approach, uh, I started by examining the spatial and environmental context shown in the video or in the GPS, looking for significant events and then uh, examining whether these events or uh, areas uh, were reflected uh, in the biosensing and interview data set. And finally, the thematic-led approach uh, took the qualitative narrative data as a starting point uh, uh, with key themes discussed by the participants, exploring then uh, whether on and how these align or not uh, with uh, biosensing data variations or uh, different areas uh, in the city. So this all might sound, yeah, thank you. That's the collective maps. Uh, this all uh, might sound very interesting. And the question is, what does it produce uh, as in terms of data and, and analysis? And firsthand, I would say it produced data that wasn't that easy to deal with 
also in the analysis and interpretation. Uh, uh, maybe also due to the small uh, sample size, but um, but through this triangulation, I was able to uh, to identify uh, some key themes uh, and uh, key findings, uh, which I will uh, present now. Uh, I think I've uh, outlined uh, five aspects uh, that stood out and uh, which I want to share with you. So first, on the aggregated level, so uh, shown on these maps here, the physiological arousal, uh, the physiological data shows that walking in urban environments shows the highest levels of arousal in at-risk mental state uh, participants followed uh, by the participants that have already experienced a first episode of psychosis. And then uh, it shows the level, the lowest level of arousal in uh, controls. Um, this is also largely reflected in the qualitative data. Uh, in the general sense, going to the city and walking in the city uh, center is often considered as more stressful or exhausting or, or producing fatigue for uh, at risk and for uh, uh, first episode uh, participants when compared to controls. As for the difference between at risk mental state and first episode psychosis, this came a bit as a surprise for me uh, to me at first, as I uh, anticipated maybe a little that uh, first episode participants would be more affected in this sense uh, uh, by um, by this, uh, by urban stress on this level. Um, one participant who had already experienced uh, an episode of psychosis explained me that he had to learn again how to deal with the urban environment uh, after uh, his episode. And I quote him, as a baby needs to learn to walk. Um, and this might explain uh, this difference between these two groups, as there is or might be a form of resilience and strategies put into place by uh, participants that have already uh, experienced the first episode of psychosis in order to deal with uh, the urban environment. I have to say also uh, that uh, um, I didn't uh, ask uh, to stop medication uh, throughout uh, this experience. Uh, so some participants were on medication and some others were not. However, uh, literature is a bit uh, controversial uh, on that aspect, but recent studies show that uh, psychotic uh, medication does not really uh, or not affect that much uh, skin conductance. So uh, this is uh, one aspect that we have to keep in mind. Maybe just then, a little clarification, if I may, uh, Mark. Yeah, A sure. is active psychosis. F is the first episode of psychosis. Is that what you said? A but is at risk mental state for psychosis, yeah. Uh, can you repeat A? A is at risk mental state for psychosis. Oh, at risk. Yeah, at risk. And yeah. F, they, F, they were actually having psychosis as you were with them or no f is a fir uh, uh, first episode of psychosis meaning they had experienced a first episode okay. of psychosis uh in a time window between one and uh three years uh before i uh walked with them through the city yes okay. and and c is uh c's controls yeah yeah thank you and so um, like you can switch to the next one. Um, I uh, then used uh, individual level uh, uh, analysis to further dig in uh, to the relation between uh, uh, cities, urban environments, physiological arousal and feelings of stress. And um, so the second aspect I want to share is the fact that the city is not arousing or experienced as stressful in a uniform manner, neither on the physiological uh, nor on the uh, qualitative narrative uh, data levels. There are situations that are described as stressful and others as relaxing, as relaxing. 
there are parts which exert uh, a physiological activation uh, and others that do not. So for example, there's no general upward trend from the start to the begin uh, from the beginning to the end in the physiological arousal. Um, and this might sound uh, uh, a bit trivial, but it helps to deconstruct uh, the idea uh, of the city as a stressful, homogeneous entity, uh, which is sometimes prevalent uh, in, uh, in the literature. So third, um, among uh, the arousing and stressful characteristics, uh, on sensory stimulations, visual perceptions of elements in motion have been identified in my study as potential sources of stress. Um, there are situations that are described as too lively, too frenetic, too hectic, uh, and these often correspond to uh, situations where there are too many or a lot of elements in motion at the same time and at different paces. Uh, so buses, streetcars, bicycles, cars, pedestrians. And these situations can sometimes be a bit difficult to apprehend for people who have experienced the first episode of psychosis and for people who are at risk, as they sometimes need to take the time to capture uh, the situation as a whole, to situate these different moving elements in uh, space before uh, continuing uh, their way. Um, however, uh, these situations described as hectic are not always uh, registered as arousing in the physiological data. Um, and we can see on the map here uh, on when the two lines cross, there is one who shows an activating trend going from orange to more uh, red, and the other one uh, uh, keeps uh, yellow, so at the low level. Um, the one when we cross uh, the river back to the city center. And this is uh, where uh, a fourth uh, aspect uh, comes into play, meaning the transitions between different sequences. Uh, the way space is experienced in a sequential way seems to play a role here. This means that the same situation can trigger various trends in arousal depending on the angle or di the direction from which it is approached. This highlights the importance to uh, take into consideration the dynamic and mobile experience of urban environments when studying urban stress. And it connects with the fifth and last uh, finding, the one relating to the built environment. Um, in general, um, arrival upon big open spaces, such as squares, uh, triggers physiological downward tendencies. Often this corresponds to a feeling of control of the situation, uh, as expressed by the participants. Uh, they explained that they appreciated that they can see what is happening, they can anticipate what is coming, and also, if needed, adapt their path and avoid certain situations. It gives them an overview of uh, the situation of what is coming ahead. It also offers uh, the possibility to look for escape routes, uh, which is also uh, appreciated uh, in, con in, uh, in contrast to spaces where there's no opportunity to get away. So, to conclude on these results, um, contrasts between these calm and more animated areas, um, I identified them as nodal points in my research in terms that the different environments and their sensory stimulation demand varying levels of attention and, concentra and concentration sorry, towards the outside world. Um, this is why I uh, frame the way participants navigate in urban environments as determined by fluctuating regimes of attention turned either inwards or outwards, uh, which are often uh, contingent on 
the environment, urban environment, and its uh, solicita solicitations. So there are, and I think you can switch to the next uh, slide, please. Um, there are, of course, um, limitations uh, to my research. And I will highlight uh, three of them. Um, first, stress is an interesting candidate uh, for understanding or studying the entanglement between uh, um, biological aspects uh, of our body and, uh, and environment, and an interesting candidate to investigate the pathway and mechanism that can link urban living to psychosis. However, an important source of concern when working with the new tools uh, and uh, new data sets I used is that the constructs that these new devices uh, aim to study are complex and multifaceted. Uh, so stress, but also emotions and feelings uh, or affect are not univocal uh, concepts, neither within nor across disciplines. So um, Hans uh, Selye, a famous researcher on stress, said almost 50 years ago, everyone knows what stress is, and yet no one knows what it is from a, a scientific perspective. So um, that's one limitation in the sense that I operationalized uh, physiological arousal uh, through skin conductance level which can be understood uh, as an index or a biomarker for stress. However, I am well aware that this is far from being the only way to study some kind of biological expressions of stress. And in addition, I did not, uh, uh, when working with uh, narratives and the declarative mode, uh, of expressed uh, stress or, or expressed feelings, I did not use um, established questionnaires such as the uh, perceived stress scale, for example, that is used in psychology, for example. And, and this is due to the methodological approach I used uh, in uh, my study, uh, which is situated somewhere between uh, the controlled context of lab research and uh, research uh, in the wild, uh, to use uh, Michel Callon's uh, expression. Um, another limit, I would say, is that my research is committed to the study of the impact of the proximate uh, uh, and immediately experienced urban environment. Uh, and uh, so the study is rather focused on uh, events and context-based uh, experience and experiences of stress. So uh, my study design did not allow me to extend the analysis to broader social contextual factors that come into play, uh, such as unemployment, access, and use of mental health services, for example. And nor did it uh, account for the cumulative uh, and long-term effects uh, of stress. Um, so while these two aspects certainly expose uh, limitations, uh, my approach is, I think, also a starting point in experimentation in the development of new approaches to urban mental health questions. And this allows me uh, to highlight a third limitation and point towards uh, future research perspectives, uh, which uh, will connect to uh, uh, the second part uh, of the presentation. So based on my um, research, I think it would seem unwarranted uh, to suggest precise urban planning uh, recommendation for healthier cities, for example, or uh, more adapted urban environments for, per for persons living with uh, psychosis. Um, and uh, this, I think, uh, is due to the rather innovative, new and experimental uh, methodology I uh, used. However, working towards health, healthier cities is an important task, 
um, but which I think would need a rather different research design, one that is anchored in a more collaborative approach with various stakeholders, such as patients, mental health professionals, local public authorities, civil society actors uh, to co-elaborate and co-design, uh, uh, as well as test various, interven various interventions capable of promoting and supporting uh, health or recovery from a psychotic episode, for example, or health and well-being in general. And this uh, is exactly uh, what uh, we are going to be able to work on uh, uh, starting in February. Um, and here again, we are working uh, at the moment on uh, obtaining clearance from uh, the local ethics committee, um, which is my task right now. So I will now um, switch from my doctoral uh, research, uh, which I've done um, to the next part. Um, on a project where I will be able to work as a postdoc, uh, postdoctoral researcher. Um, just a quick question on time, we're uh, fine. I couldn't hear it. How about 10 more minutes? Yeah, okay, fine, perfect. Um, so this new project uh, um, wasn't designed by myself. Um, although I was uh, a participant uh, in some uh, discussions, but it is a project that is led by Professor Philippe Connu, who is head of the psychiatry department at University Hospital in Lausanne, and by Professor Ola Söderström, who was uh, my PhD supervisor and who is professor of human geography at the University of uh, Neuchâtel. So the project uh, is financed by the Swiss National Science Foundation and will last uh, three years. And basically, this project tries to flip the way we approached urban psychosis nexus uh, so far uh, and flip it upside down. So meaning my approach falls in the line of the general trend in psychiatry, which is to consider urban environments as a risk factor for psychosis. And uh, Professor uh, Ola Söderström and, uh, and Philippe Gonu uh, worked on a first uh, project together that was also in some ways uh, directed towards this aspect. And their previous project uh, was called Understanding the Relation Between Psychosis and Urban Milieu, an experience-based approach. So this study, uh, their previous study, among other results, uh, comparing controls uh, and patients uh, uh, found that uh, the development of psychosis increased city avoidance, uh, meaning that after onset of symptoms, patients tended to avoid the city and the city centers. Uh, however, this project and also mine um, planted the seed uh, for considering urban milieus as a potential resource for recovery in our heads. So to considering cities as a potential vector for remediation after an episode of psychosis, because the two researchers also highlight some of the positive potentialities of cities. So while the urban living is correlated with a higher prevalence and risk for psychosis, it is also associated with better access to mental health care uh, lower rates of treatment resistance, for example. Uh, cities are also much more than a source of stress as they provide uh, access uh, to essential resources for social, economic, and cultural integration, for example. Thus, despite their potential uh, adverse effect, uh, effects on mental health, some aspects of urban living may also play a role in the process of recovery from uh, psychosis or other uh, psychiatric disorders. So we draw on this, uh, on these uh, results and researches to considering cities as milieus that could foster uh, recovery processes. Uh, and so cities are not only mediators for psychosis, but also milieus, milieus sorry, for remediation. Um, so this new project uh, is called Urban Remediation in Early Psychosis, a living lab to in place recovery in the city. 
and I will give a bit more details uh, on that. Um, so to expand the idea of urban remediation, we aim to work in an interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary manner based on a living lab approach. So research into recovery models have already demonstrated that partnerships between patients and mental health professionals are the best ways to build efficient treatments uh, that are adapted to a patient needs. Uh, our overall goal is therefore to promote recovery in urban milieus and by urban milieus, so to say, using a strategy co-designed with patients, mental health professionals, local authorities. Um, and besides aiming to broaden scientific knowledge and reveal insights into psychosis recovery process in, in urban context, this uh, project aims to is oriented towards supporting clinical and public health interve interventions that could be or will be implemented in the city of Lausanne and why not at a larger scale. Um, so uh, we work with uh, patients, psychiatrists, nurses, peer practitioners, geographers, urban planners, uh, as well as local public authorities or uh, civil society actors such as a cafe and uh, restaurant owners, for example, or uh, museums. At least this is the ambition since we are at the very start of this uh, project. So all uh, these uh, professionals and persons uh, form a panel uh, that acts as a central element in this new project. It's, uh, it's a steering board where every step of the research is discussed on a regular basis while the project unfolds. Uh, so the panel is uh, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, and includes uh, uh, patients, care workers, uh, and uh, other professionals. Uh, this panel hold already six uh, previous meetings before we submitted our proposal uh, to obtain uh, uh, financial support from the Swiss National Science Foundation. Uh, and and uh, these discussions showed that um, the themes and procedures uh, uh, we wish to address were uh, highly relevant uh, uh, for improving trajectories of recovery. So I will you can switch the last one. I will quickly describe uh, what we uh, aim to do um, through uh, what we call a living lab approach. So living lab approaches are usually based on or, or four uh, main uh, phases, uh, one being exploration, the other co-creation, then experimentation and implementation, and then we can make a retroactive uh, uh, cycle and start again to explore again and make things evolve. So this is the idea behind our uh, project. And um, we will start with a, uh, an explorative participatory mapping uh, of uh, various resources and obstacles uh, for recovery in the city center of uh, Lausanne. Uh, we draw here on the work on uh, Cameron Duff on enabling places, uh, considering uh, social, affective, and material uh, resources or obstacles uh, that uh, we think uh, we want to explore. Um, we will do this through uh, uh, transects or mobile interviews through the city of Lausanne and then a collective uh, moment where uh, uh, we uh, produce a collective maps uh, with a discussion hold with every participants and other uh, uh, persons uh, implied in the project. And then uh, we will have, uh, have a, a focus group with the participants in order to uh, try to identify uh, with them possible interventions that they would see as uh, useful for promoting a more adapted urban environment. Um, this will go on with other discussions uh, hold with the local authorities, also international experts, uh, in order to try to uh, identify a set of uh, inter interventions on various levels that we will implement or uh, hopefully implement in a neighborhood of uh, the city center of Lausanne. 
uh, and then uh, um, let things run uh, for a year or so with monitoring, uh, looking what is going on, uh, making uh, some discussions and interviews all along the project uh, to test and evaluate uh, the responsiveness of, of, of these interventions on different levels. And then hopefully in a last step, uh, take some of uh, the, uh, the, the strategies or interventions that worked and try to uh, uh, upscale them at the city center, uh, not, not only at the city center, but at the city of uh, Louvain and promoting an urban uh, mental health uh, uh, plan for the city, which uh, does not exist uh, for the moment here. I think I will stop here. Hopefully I um, haven't taken too much time. No, it's perfect. It's exactly 50 minutes, so it's uh, well done. Um, okay, I'll close the no, PowerPoint is closed. Uh, uh, we have some applause also. Uh, uh, well, thanks a lot, uh, Mark, for this really uh, interesting presentation and uh, also uh, extremely original, I could say, like the method you use. Uh, I've not heard anybody use them, so uh, I would like to thank you all. Perfect. Yeah, okay. thanks. Thanks for the organization and invitation. Bye then. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.